the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Perspective. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Full house tonight because we're talking about a major issue in Nashville. This is something that is getting a lot of discussion. The effects of gentrification. Essentially, as property values rise, it's forcing out people who have lived in neighborhoods for generations. And what impact does that have on, on the neighborhoods themselves and on the city as a whole? Happy to have a large panel here to discuss this. First of all, we have Dr. Anthony Campbell, Assistant Professor of Public Administration at TSU. Dr. Campbell, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Kay Bowers, Executive Director of New Level Community Development Corporation. Kay, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And Marie Ball, a master's uh, a student at Tennessee State University. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. So, all right, gentrification. Uh, how would you define it? And, and what, what, are we, what are we seeing in Nashville? And, I, and I'll start with you. you know, how, how would you define it? What are we seeing? Sure, I mean, I think that actually is one of the key dilemmas with gentrification, right? Is that we need to have a localized definition of what constitutes gentrification, right? I mean, yes, there's defining qualities, right? There's essentially three basic characteristics. You have the displacement of original residents. You have some sort of upgrading to the neighborhood, typically in terms of the housing stock. You have some loss of original character. But those issues vary so much within a city, they vary so much between different cities that there's this necessity to come up with a localized definition of gentrification here in Nashville. And I think the absence of that is kind of what has left us at this crossroads we're in right now. And so where we are, we're, we're booming. And so some might say, boy, property value is going up, that's a good thing. You know, people moving here and, and, and the economic vitality that we're seeing, that's a good thing. And so how is this a concern when we're talking about, I guess, obviously people being displaced, but how is it a concern when prices rise so quickly is what we're seeing? Well, I can speak to that. Sure. Uh, according to data from a researcher with Metro Social Services, um, he shared with me uh, a month or so ago that the average uh, income of a worker in Nashville is $36,000. $36,000. That's not a lot. Mm -mm. Um, so we have a gap between wages and housing cost. It's a significant gap. And in Nashville, over 49%, this is data from, that's just published in a recent report by Metro Social Services, over 49% of our renters are housing cost burdened, which means they're paying more than 30% of their income for rent and over 31% of our homeowners are housing cost burden. So when people are using so much of their income to cover their housing cost, they have less and less and less and less to cover the other necessities of life. So then when you tack on transportation costs to that, people are really squeezed. And what that does is it puts stress on families. If families are in stress, kids are under stress, they don't perform in schools. Uh, and it's that therein lies the problem is it's significant impact on the people that, that we depend on every day in Nashville to help us run the city and keep the city operating. At, at TSU, there was recently a panel that talked about this and, and uh, Dr. Campbell, you were on it, and Marie, you were on it, right? And what what were you all kind of focusing on there? I mean, kind of the essence of what, what you all, why, why did you feel it was so important, this topic, to discuss? Well, being in the College of Public Service, we just felt like what issue affects us personally the most? And looking uh, just around in the area of Nashville, you see new condos, new housing properties opening up, and for a graduate student, we wouldn't be able to afford to live there. So it, that's something that would affect us, affect a lot of people. You have neighborhoods like uh, Bordeaux out in North Nashville that are seeing this rapid change and people uh, don't know how to react to it exactly. So that's pretty much the catalyst that was like, we need to discuss this and bring it out to the forefront for people to have a better understanding of what exactly is this growth that's occurring in Nashville other than you have people who may have a little bit more money coming into a neighborhood that does, they don't have m that much money, uh, which it, it could mean so many different things that's 
happening and just making sure that people are aware of the changes that are occurring here and what can they do to be included in that growth. And what did, what did you come up with? Uh, what we came up with is to show a film that sh uh, uh, I found a documentary called Northeast Passage. Basically what is occurring here in Nashville was happening in um, uh, Portland, Oregon uh, a decade prior. But the way, uh, the way it transitioned is pretty similar to what I saw what was trending in Nashville at the time. So I thought that was a really good example of this happened on the West Coast. It could happen anywhere, you know, regardless of regardless of the region or, or it may be. So uh, it was the main focus of the documentary was on a um, homeowner uh, named Nikki. Uh, she got a house through Habitat for Humanity in this predominantly black neighborhood. And uh, her goal was to make sure she had a safe environment for her daughter to live and play in. And uh, the neighborhood was notorious for uh, drugs and gangs and she pretty much acted alone to try to get those people out and have you know good people in that neighborhood that deserve that was going to con contribute to that community and help it thrive rather than just go down to squalor mm -hmm. so instead of that happening what you start to notice was these developers started coming in these uh these houses were really being, being built and priced at a rate that not a lot of people could afford uh, to live there. Uh, where people were, who've been the, in the neighborhood for years were suddenly being um, priced out, which is the subsequent documentary um, for Northeast Passage. So it shows the, pretty much the beginning the, of the whole process of the growth, where it may be a you're not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad right. thing. Right. It's interesting it's yeah. happened in other cities. <laughs> it is. We've seen it in other cities. And so the question is, what can we do here? Because I think, as you were saying earlier, before the sh when the cat's out of the bag, what do you do? I mean, in some of these neighborhoods, 12 South or the, the Nations right. or, or Germantown, good grief. What's happened there in the last few years? How, how, how do we, I don't know, what, what do we do about that? And I'm sure property, there's some property owners there um, who are overjoyed their property has gone up so much. And so what do they, what do they do, you know? Well, well, this is, you know, one of the things about it, right, as you touched on earlier, is that it is embedded in gentrification is a positive thing, right? I mean, it's the outgrowth of something that every city leader around this country is fighting to have, right? I mean, gentrification doesn't happen economically depressed cities. So, you know, the, the complicated nature of it is in fact that, that it, it's simultaneously a, a product of something good, but there's potentially devastating effects, right? So this intersectoral collaboration, and that was really the credit of Marie's, she really undersold herself there, she really designed that event we had dur during Black History Month, is we wanted to see when you get these different groups together, what is the potential there? How do we begin to see that different groups define it so differently, but there can be a common thread there? So. You know, we began to see that, you know, in as much as you have groups who are historically antagonistic with one another, there is the potential to move past it, right? And there is the kind of takeaway we wanted people to have that evening was the power of dialogue. And the only way you get to any sort of an intersectoral collaboration is if you have dialogue, you have some mutual understanding, you have some degree of mutual respect. So I think that's where we have to get to. But absent trying to build some relationship with these groups that are so inherently antagonistic at times, right, feeling betrayed, feeling burdened, we don't work past it. But I think that's the value of some of the work with Cage mm -hmm. Group is trying to engage these groups and get them to move past some of those initial uh, feelings of animosity and at times hatred. What you see to me is also the supply and demand situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're right. Th these things are being built everywhere. I don't know how. I've seen the prices. I don't know how students would afford them, but somebody's paying for it. Mm -hmm. Somebody's buying these things and renting these things at these at these huge prices. And so, with supply and demand, how how do we go against the market? You know, well, how, let me just let me talk about the market. Okay. Um, um, a report by Dr. Jim Fraser with Vanderbilt. He's a professor at Vanderbilt, and he's really known across the country as one of the experts on this very topic and works with many cities. Um, but he was asked to do a report along with the Nashville Next planning process that we went through in 2014. 
Um, and he did, uh, conducted a lot of studies, a lot of interviews, and what Nashvillians uh, uh, told him was that they agree with experts around the country that the housing market will not automatically create housing choice throughout our communities. It, it won't automatically produce or preserve housing that's affordable, and it won't automatically protect vulnerable citizens living in gentrifying neighborhoods or create neighborhoods where all income levels will live. We believe that's, that's a fact, that the housing market in our country, the way we're designed, just will not um, do that. And since the recession in Nashville, like many other communities, the housing that was built post-recession was not housing for middle-income families, even it's housing, luxury housing, housing for people at higher income levels. Uh, and many outside investors came in, snatched up a lot of basement, mm -hmm. bargain priced properties, uh, and then we're off to the races. So uh, what communities like Portland have done though, uh, and Eugene, and Seattle, and they will tell you that no, we are, we are not to the point where we can say we are successful, but they have more tools that they are utilizing than Nashville does. And so they use things like uh, community land trust, which separates land from the built uh, product above it. And the land stays, can stay in the trust for 99 years, and that makes the home more affordable to the people that are going to live in those homes. They're called community land trusts. They're used in many places across the country and have been used for decades. Um, so that's just one of the tools. That, so there are some tools out that there. That can be brought that can be brought to bear on the problem to deal with uh, the inequitable nature of gentrification. We're streaming this also on our Facebook page, on our News Channel 5 Facebook page. So you can go there and you can put a comment down in the comment section. I'll read some of those. Um, Michelle Lee Smith is saying create new neighborhoods. And when you see, when you see again the prices in some of these other neighborhoods, the Nation's 12 South, Germantown now, maybe we do need new neighborhoods. But let's, let's take a break. Uh, if you want to call, there's the number. 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. Uh, we'll take a break. Be back right after this.